All right then, um, this is just going to be a quick tutorial about uh, how to use Cavalry in conjunction with Adobe Illustrator and After Effects. The first half of the video is basically going to be me in Illustrator, so if you don't want to know about that, flick forward um, and we'll get into Cavalry in a little bit. So the way I do it, well, I've done a little sketch there on the left hand side, it's always good to work from something. Um, just even if it's really rough, so you can kind of just have an idea of what you want to shoot for. And what I've done here is I've made a grid um, to just build everything around, because uh, my notebook is dotted, and it's easy to just kind of make things if you um, have a grid to work to, and it makes things a lot simpler, so you don't really have to make positional decisions yourself. You can just rely on what the grid is telling you and you can make shapes um, j just from the grid and it'll immediately give it a more mathematical and structured look. Um, I'm sure there are other people who do these kinds of tutorials that will say the same thing. You can get all kinds of grids. I'm using Illustrator but you can use um, Affinity Designer or you know, you, well you could do this in Cavalry. The only reason I didn't do this in Cavalry was because um, I just wanted, I was testing the workflow of exporting an SVG from Illustrator uh, to go into Cavalry. You could do all of this in Cavalry and Cavalry has a very good grid um, and alignment system which uh, is, is, is perfectly fine. There's nothing I do in this tutorial that um, you couldn't just do in Cavalry if you wanted. Um, so when I was drawing this, I realised that I'd not. I'd started doing this, and it wasn't really in line with the grid um, on the image on the left-hand side. But instead of starting again, I just thought we'll uh, we'll make the most of it, and we'll just plow on through. Um, this wasn't really too much of an exercise in, uh, you know, the design. And I'm not very good with Illustrator at all. It's not my, uh, it's not my forte. Um, so very rudimentary. There's probably people who will watch this and know better ways to do the things that I'm doing and probably screaming at the computer saying, why do you keep doing the same uh, repetitive motions, but that's just me. I've never learned to use Illustrator as well as I should have. But basically, the way I work with Illustrator is I will, well, a lot of the time, um, UI things they'll be relatively symmetrical. Um, it, it tends to give it a much, I don't know, more uh, machined feel if there's an element. It's nice to have asymmetry in the design because it makes it feel as though you haven't just copy and pasted and reflected um, but the, the majority of my designs will usually have the symmetry and then we'll deviate from that later on so it's a it's a lot easier to kind of add asymmetrical details once the symmetrical design has been done and then you can deviate and as i was saying before it's easier to do these things in a notepad and kind of work out well that doesn't look very good i can you know well i won't do that when i'm doing the design so it's nice to make your mistakes on paper so you don't have to waste your time making the mistakes you know in um in illustrator not that i don't make mistakes here as we're doing this i can see my oh renaming things in the layer uh the layers section it, it's not important that you do this here this was just so if i want to come back into this scene i know what's what and things are vaguely categorized into something that i can work with it's good if you want to well i'll, I'll just start by talking a little bit about cavalry you can watch me just kind of slowly designing this i don't know how helpful that is, is in the background but i'll just talk a little bit how how I'm going to use this in Cavalry and the limitations of Cavalry and why then I have to bring it into After Effects. So at the moment Cavalry doesn't have any Z-space um, so it's not got the ability to do a uh, 2.5D function where we can kind of emulate cameras and depth of field and things like that. So 
that's why we then bring it into After Effects after the cavalry section. Um, but if we wanted to split out, uh, say, the middle part of this design and have that raised up higher in After Effects, we could, you know, split these out into three PNG sequences. Because I will, I could come out of cavalry and say render a top layer, a middle layer, and a bottom layer that I could then stagger in After Effects. I haven't done this in this tutorial, but that's something you can do. And I will say that they are, as far as I'm aware, they have plans to introduce 2.5D into Cavalry into the pipeline at some point. Um, I don't know whether it's in the near future, um, but it's definitely something that will mean I wouldn't have to use After Effects anymore. It's about the only thing, apart from a few kind of choice compositing effects that I use After Effects for now. Yeah, we'll get back to the design. Um, I'll tend to design a quadrant and just flip that on, uh, say, the Y or the X axis, and then just you'll have that design on both sides um, exactly the same, and then you can deviate as you want to. Um, at the moment, I'm just adding. Um, it's nice when you have the big main elements of your design and you've worked out well these are the main pieces these are the the thickest lines and then going back in and over and adding accent lines around some of the the larger lines just a lot a little bit of fine detail so it looks a little more granular all i do for the most part with these things is just um select a path and and offset that path either five ten pixels whichever suits um you know the design you're working on and that will expand the path around itself and then you can just pick and choose where you want these um where these accent lines to be and it's just a quick way of adding detail without having to think about it really um and it just makes it feel a little more well it looks a lot more complicated and it doesn't take you that much work to do and these things have always been whenever i've the things i wish i knew when i started doing kind of hud design and things like that it's you really want to spend as little time as possible kind of adding these details not because well you could you could spend all day going over these things and um, you know thinking about them and they, they can they can be really considered but you don't always have the luxury and you might not always want to you know spend hours and hours and hours pouring over every single design you just kind of want to flex your creative muscles so with this tutorial I wanted to keep it relatively short and sweet and just try and get as much detail in as time allowed because I didn't want to you know, spend a crazy amount of time um, on this segment of the tutorial um, this is all sped up three times by the way it might be four times so I don't actually work as quick as this um, but yeah so th that's just one of the things I do is uh, try to add fine detail the easiest way possible and that just comes from taking the things you've already considered and uh, using those in an effective way sorry my phone is going off I'll turn that off um, and then I was just adding a few little crosses and things there. They're really cheap ways to add intricacy to your design. Um, little circle, geometric, very basic geometric shapes. For this design, it was more, um, there's no squares really. And there's no, there's nothing more than a kind of, you know, a, a four-sided shape. It's just crosses and circles and things like that so you're really bread and butter um geometric uh ui design thing very kind of ash thorp looking i know you have to kind of give ash thorp a, a shout out when you're uh, doing any kind of tutorials but this i mean there's no sense to this design that i'm building it's um obviously it's some kind of heads up display with a crosshair in the middle um there's no information i don't bring any text and you can there's the only reason i didn't um bring text and kind of things into this design is because it wasn't really what i was trying to show this design is more about i want to show you how easy it is to use cavalry to animate something that has been created 
with that seems to have a lot of parts. So you would look at this as an Instagram post, or you'd look at um, this as an Illustrator file as maybe an animator, and you'd well up until now you would have had to go oh right well I'm going to need I'm going to need the Illustrator file in a certain way to get it to work with After Effects or Cinema 4D. I need all the layers separate, and they all need to be named fastidiously, and uh, everything needs to kind of come in uh, so so it can be useful to you as an animated but now with cavalry it's uh, made it possible to be incredibly lazy which for me as a I don't know, motion designer and animator is it's the best thing ever because i know i was harping on about labeling things before but you really did cavalry takes a lot of this away and what this tutorial is about is how you can make a design you can spend a lot of time drawing the design and not have to worry too much about the animation as long as you know that you won't have uh, granular control over every single line. But a lot of the time I find you don't really need that because I think the animation we end up making is about five seconds long and over the course of that five seconds the animation period of that takes one second so and there's and we'll get into this later there's a kind of randomized stagger on the timing of the animation uh, so there's only two keyframes that we'll get into but I'll, I'll talk about that later um but it's a very short amount of time so unless you're going to watch something over and over again you wouldn't necessarily know that we just randomized the animation there would people would just assume you were shit hot uh, animating things they think well he's done really well uh he must have spent ages doing it he must have spent ages doing this and it's it's kind of why i want to do this tutorial i love cavalry um i had the, the kind of privilege of um kind of being there as it was developed and you know having having the privilege of talking to the guys who developed it and they could take um if I had any problems, they could kind of take it into account and build it into the software, and uh, which made it nice and easy to kind of get good at this because cavalry can be quite daunting. But it cavalry makes this all super easy, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll see as we go forward quite how easy that is. Um, but we could add text to this design in my sketch when I'm drawing the squares. In my head I had those would be um, zoomed in views of whatever the HUD was looking at. So 10 times or 100 times. And we we could definitely do that in Calvary. I can maybe explain that in a different tutorial where it's more cavalry centric. Um, uh, but for now it's just kind of dots and lines. What else? What else can I talk about? I think we're nearly done on this segment. I hope so. I've been feel like I've been doing this for a million years. I'm not doing this as we speak. Yeah, I pre-recorded this and then I'm waffling over the top of it. Now what I'm doing is just and again things I wish I'd known when I was starting out. It's you can make your designs look well considered and thought out by literally scattering random things about the place. Um, you don't really need to if there was a design purpose for this like if say someone had hired me to make this uh, for something for a ship i mean there, there's things to consider well what kind of ship what's the purpose of that ship and what's the purpose of this screen but you know for this there isn't any purpose so we can add the meaningless details to make it look busier um, and a cheap way to do that is uh, points and crosses so you can always add a few of them in and with cavalry I like to do um, randomized numbers and things on a on a kind of grid or you can we could say we could make a bunch of squares and have numbers appear in the top left hand corner and they those numbers could scatter through i don't know how to do that in illustrator i don't know if you can um but i didn't want to get into fonts and text and things like that in this tutorial um but we will we'll, we'll get into it later so yeah just adding a little bit of granular detail um will always help just flesh out those um dark areas which you may not even be able to see a lot of these details sometimes but when you look at something as a whole later on they uh, they tend to just make it feel more full um it's uh, definitely worth doing if you've got a design you're not quite sure what 
what's missing it might just be that you need some meaningless greeble um type things not gonna but i think this is the end i'm pretty sure this is the end so we're gonna go into cavalry in a moment and we'll talk more about that yes yeah, so i just wanted to um just explain a little about how i export um what you just saw in illustrator to bring into cavalry basically all you do is you just go uh, save as and then export as an svg all as one big shape just a whole artboard we obviously can if you want more control is to do separate layers separate svgs and it'll just give you more independent control and then as soon as you come into cavalry you just uh, import the asset uh, as a full SVG and then uh, we should be up to speed for when we jump into Calvary. So we'll get into that now. All right, so you drop your SVG shape in. It's gonna come in, it might look messy. Basically, in the left-hand side near Tribute Editor, there's uh, two tick boxes at the bottom uh, with kind of green ticks. You need to untick them because we are gonna use a sub mesh to break apart our one SVG shape. Um, which is going to override the stroke controls. So we don't even need to have that checked. We're going to, in a second, I'll add the sub mesh in. Um, what I didn't realize when I made this, I'm in a more recent build than some of you might have, is they've added a feature that um, is called levels to the uh, sub mesh, which in the sub mesh you can use for all kinds of things text. Um, duplicate is just to break it apart into its component pieces. I didn't realize they'd added levels, which must give you a um, modicum of control at different levels so you can break groups down um, more. You can dive into the hierarchy more and split them apart for more individuality. Uh, I didn't know that, so uh, apologies for the slight confusion when we start here. Basically, what we're going to do, we're going to animate all of these paths in one go with one set of keyframes. So set the keyframes 50-50. So they start from the middle of the strokes as opposed to one end, and then go 30 frames in and put one to 100, oh, one to zero. Uh, and what that's gonna do is gonna let us see um, all of those strokes will kind of animate from their midpoint to the conclusion, which is the shape you see now. So if you flick over to the graph editor, it's just on a little tab at the bottom. Um, you can select the start and end right click and change it to Bezier curves. Now, if you select all the points and grab one of them and move them in, hold down shift, I think, to lock it in, it'll give you a nice curvy tangent and hopefully we'll play back here in real time. Now, I remember when I was recording this, there seems to be a slight bug where if you let the playback run all the way through, something strange happens at the end, but this is real time playback. That's one set Z, there you go. <laughs> They're onto the bug, I know that much. It, it's, it's been logged. Um, I try and avoid that moving forward. But as you can see, we've animated all of that in one go. Now at the moment, they all just happen as one. What we want to do is, uh, we want to randomize that, right? To make it look like we did every one of these paths individually. So we're gonna go time offset on the sub mesh behavior tab. We're gonna add a random to that. And I'll go more into behaviors later, and I realize I'm now talking over this tutorial. I did this far too quick, but I remember I messed this bit up. I can't remember why. I think it has something, to, again, to do with the levels. Like I've set the levels to 1-1, one, one, so they all happen at the same time. Basically, what the random node should do is stagger the time that they start to animate by 20 frames. So we've set our keyframes 0 to 30, but they should start anywhere between 0 to 20 and end 30 to 50 so it gives us a nice staggered kind of um, feeling as if we'd done each line individually and they will all come on uh, with those curves still uh, and we can obviously change that random seed um, that you can see on the random node there so they we could render this out a hundred different times and they would always render differently so if you wanted if you had one HUD design, but you wanted five ways of it animating on, we can do that with one click. There we go. I think I realized at this point that the levels, again, I don't understand what the levels is doing. I will find out. Uh, so if in future tutorials, I'll be able to um, explain in any way what, what it's doing. From what I can tell is, I don't know what S and E means. This isn't the greatest tutorial uh, that you're ever gonna watch. Uh, I think what I realized was, that you need to set the level mode to all 
and then it begins to give you the effect that you used to have. We never used to have these level modes. As I say, cavalry is one of these things, and if you're in the Discord group, that's great, um, because it's always amazing when someone shouts out a problem, um, and the development team seem quite keen on putting in solutions to so many problems. There we go. I've worked it out now, and as you can see, um, as we do the animation, they all come in um, separately. No idea what I'm doing there. Great. Now we want to make all the lines look a little bit different. What I wanted to do, ideally, was have the length of each line dictate how wide the width of the stroke would be. Now, this tool has now been put in to a builder cavalry, but I don't have access to that build. Um, and that would work. So we could dictate if a line is this long, it will be like one thick, and if it's shorter, it'll be 0.1. And then we can also drive the color from that. That's not in this build, so I didn't do it. I just stuck a random on it. So again, right click on the width, you can add a random node. And then in the minimum and maximum, self-explanatory, the maximum is the thickest it's randomly gonna apply. The minimum is the minimum width that any given line can be. And there you go. That's pretty much all the animating that is required of this kind of technique. It's very, um, rough and ready obviously if you wanted to art direct things you'd need to come in and be a little more granular about what you were animating and when if you wanted to come up there are ways we can do that with fall offs but again we'll get into that later maybe with a bit of a simpler uh, shape setup all I'm doing now is adding um, noise onto the position of the layers and as you can see it almost looks like there's a parallaxing effect happening and um, this was just me messing around because I haven't been in cavalry for a little while and it was fun to just drop um, you know drop some uh, effects onto other parameters and just kind of see what comes out and I thought that looked kind of cool um, ideally I'd kind of workshop that a little more and have the inside layers moving uh, faster than the outside layers so the outside layers barely moved and the inside layers moved a lot there will be a way to do it but I wanted to keep it kind of brief um, here we go, I'm just changing the colors now. And there's a little box there in the scene window that you click on and you can change the color. Now what I'm gonna do here is add a color array to the sub mesh stroke color. What a color array is gonna do, it's going to apply in a modular fashion uh, the colors that you input into this array up there you can add. So at the moment it's applying the colors white, white, green along the index of the stroke so one two three and then they you know they go up in that kind of color what we're going to do after this is add a random node into the index of the color array so i'm going to flick off auto index in a moment that you can see at the top of the color array which at the moment is just saying one two three four five do the colors as you see them we're going to turn that off and we're going to right click on the index tab and add a random again and put in the into the minimum and maximum the amount of uh, kind of color stops that we have so it will pull randomly and apply to the strokes the colors that we have suggested in there which is quite nice here oh I'm, i didn't do the random on the color array whoops what i'm doing here i've gone back into the sub mesh and uh, applied a value array into the at the alpha the opacity of the strokes and what I'm gonna do here is add a noise into the auto index so at the moment I'm saying 100% of, it's gonna flick through these numbers at a very high speed to make it look like it's got a bit of a screen flicker um, and the way it's gonna do that is we're gonna turn auto index off we're gonna add a noise into the array index and basically it's gonna give uh, an opacity value based on the numbers that we've put in the value array. So it's gonna flick, and I'm turning the speed up so it goes super quick. Uh, there we go. You can see there, now all the lines are flicking on and off. But I thought that's a bit heavy, so I was like, it wasn't quick enough. So now that's mentally epileptic. Uh, I t believe I turn that down in a minute. And I take, I make it more uh, opaque for the most part. Um, 
just so it looks a bit more flickery and doesn't completely ever cut out. Um, next time I'm going to be a little slower on the mouse uh, for some of these. I believe this is real time speed as well, so I was powering through this. Jesus. Yeah, I toned this down. There you go. And then um, I'm pretty sure we render out after this, unless I add a uh, random to the color away array, which I should have done, but maybe not. Um, I think we just go into After Effects. So basically, what we do is what am I doing? I don't remember doing anything at this point. Ah. I was gonna mess about with a blur filter. Basically, Calvary's got a few kind of inbuilt effects and there's gonna be more glows and things like that, I'm told. Um, but I wanted to see if applying a blur randomly to the lines on the horizontal axis made it look as though it was kind of uh, shifting in and out of focus and giving it almost a fake depth of field. And then I realized I was adding this into After Effects and it's overkill and then the playback slowed down and I thought oh, it's going to take ages rendering because I've applied an effect that I don't really need. So I binned it off. Uh, yeah. So basically what we're going to do, we're going to render it out. We're just rendering out one PNG sequence, um, a kind of double the resolution that we want so we can zoom in in After Effects. So if you want your kind of, uh, um, if you want your composition in After Effects to be 1080, render it out at 240 and um, you will uh, you know kind of get a, a bit of wiggle room on your zoom um, so yeah if you want a 1k square render out 2k if you want a 2k square render out 4k um, and then you'll you'll get what you need there Calvary does have a great uh, folder organizing system that I haven't utilized for this tutorial uh, Ian covers this in a lot of his tutorials I believe um, and he will be better placed to uh, to explain a lot of these kind of things. So basically I've just clicked render and I'm gonna skip through this bit because you just don't need to see it. Great, into After Effects and uh, I've already brought in my uh, PNG sequence and I've dropped it into a composition and I'm just halving the size of my composition. So again, we have that zoom that we wanna do. Um, so we're going to add a camera into the scene. You can just see I'm just flicking through, just making sure everything's coming right. And it has, and it looks okay. Um, I don't know why I shrink, shrink it down. Do not shrink it down to 50%. That is not needed. Uh, I think it was just to show you guys what it looks like playing back through real time. Uh, I rendered out too much. So what I do is um, I trim the size of that comp just down to five seconds. Um, just so we've got the intro and about you know three seconds of it doing something interesting um great so we had a camera uh, the shortcut for that is alt Control shift c if you're on windows mac i'm not going to help you out um basically then you make a null uh alt Control shift y and then you parent the camera to the control the null uh, which I've renamed Cam Control. It's because cameras in After Effects I find horrible um, to deal with. We're going to turn Depth of Field off. Why am I turning that off? Turn Depth of Field off. And then we're going to use the null to position the camera. You go into four views and it's going to bring up your four panels um, to kind of show you um, where your focus is for the camera. So basically we've got depth of field turned on. And you're gonna to wanna to just shift focus until you see that line uh, come into contact with where your kind of work uh, art is. Then we're gonna go into control, press R to bring up rotation, turn on 3D, make sure everything's a 3D layer. Should have mentioned that. Uh, and you just find an angle that you like. I tend to find that using all three of the orientations uh, it tends to give you something better than just using one uh, axis. It's, you get a lot more kind of interesting dynamic angles. And then zoom in the position of your camera. The position, the Z depth of your camera should be the only thing that you move positionally on your camera. Everything else, control it with a null. Uh, it might seem backwards, but I've just found that is the easiest way to control After Effects cameras. Um, it's good practice and not having too many you know, controls on the camera itself. Um, and then re refocus back on where you were. Now there's a couple of things that make 
the depth of field a little more believable in uh, After Effects. One of the main things is if you drop down your menu and go into camera options, there's an iris shape. And a lot of cameras kind of have aperture blades. We won't go into it. Uh, it's But six is a good number. I think that might be a realistic number. Um, aperture is the amount of blur that you gain. Um, and uh, yeah, then you've got the shape, which gives you. I like the hexagon. You can uh, uh, go through a couple in a second, so you can see the um, the different shapes. Uh, you can see a triangle. I think hexagon is nice. The square looks good for this as well. Just depends on what you look. It's these bits are all pretty much to do with your taste and style. Um, but I like using the hexagon and changing the aspect ratio of the RS to 1.3. Just so it's a little more anamorphic. Um, I don't know. Just gives it a little more character. Um, great, I don't know what we're going to do now. I believe we're going to add some effects. If it was me doing it again, I would now add a layer underneath the layer um, to make it look like it's sitting above reflective glass. So it looks like it's reflecting itself underneath. So you do that, you'd select your main layer. Ow, I'm moving the camera. Very good. So again, don't put um, keyframes on your camera um, it's better to do it on the null that's the way I find it and you only need you get a nice smooth motion um, look at that that's not too bad camera's moving a little bit quickly I think so uh, just stop it halfway um, add a keyframe Oop. Do that very well. Add a keyframe about halfway, delete the last keyframe, and shut that middle keyframe all the way down, and it'll kind of half the motion that you've done. Great. Now it's moving. Um, yeah, so now are we going to duplicate? Yes. Duplicate that layer. Call one layer main, and call one layer reflection. And basically, what it's going to emulate like a screen reflection of an old TV. You're going to move that second layer down in Z space at like a, a small amount and put your t a layer above the screen so we can see through. Um, turn the opacity on the reflection layer down and add a Gaussian blur uh, to, uh, you know, again, this is tasting, so you can have that as opaque as you want, but I find very low values of like both opacity and blurriness will um, render the best effect. Uh, you might notice that I'm using a shortcut to put effects on. Um, and I will put a link to that plugin that you can get in this video because it's weirdly helpful. Um, so I've added another layer, just duplicated the layer, added it on top, um, change the blending mode to add, and um, change just again, reduce the opacity. Now, something's going on with the, the glow or something, it just looked awful. So I end up deleting this layer because it looks it looked rubbish <laughs> so uh, yeah ignore everything I'm doing now because I'm about to delete this glow layer sometimes again you find that some things you do don't work even if you've done the exact same thing in a different composition and you just think well it's, it's just not working for this um, and there's nothing wrong with that so I get rid of it try again uh, there you go suddenly realizing that it doesn't look good so I binned it off um, I have a bunch of plugins personally that I use that I haven't used for this tutorial. Um, there's a lot of Red Giant plugins that are great for just presets for doing things like, um, you know, uh, chromatic aberration and things like that. At the moment, you'll see I'm just looking through my files for some dust, and we're going to add a layer of dust above our screen. It's just so it looks um, like it's, you know, collect it's, it's old, it's been sat there, and like it's sat somewhere in the real world. Make sure you don't have the sequence tick. That's what I just did. Turn that off. Import it. Drop it in. It's probably going to be too big. So we're going to scale it down and turn the 3D layer on. It's going to sit it in our scene. We're going to need to turn it to screen um, again. So we'll toggle the switches and modes and turn that to screen. And then we'll be able to see through the black. I'm going to turn the opacity way down and then what I tend to do is add a tint um, to these um, oh I always lift the dust up into the space so it looks like it's sat slightly above the graphics and then I tint the dust or fingerprints and make it grey um, just so I've got more control over the opacity and it sits in the comp usually a lot better I mean you can barely see it that's the point
point you shouldn't see these things really they should be almost not there um less is more with all these things and again i've had depth of field turned off on my camera just for you know speed um i'm gonna add some fingerprints now classic uh classic thing to do if you want to make things look real add surface imperfections now i'm using a pack from polygon um which is really good i mean it's the one i use most um polygon surface imperfections it's great little shout out there give me some free stuff um <laughs> yeah you know again same same concept with the dust turn on screen turn on 3d layer and shrink it down so the size is right I'm going to use this as a blur layer, so what you do is you pre-comp this layer, you have to turn on 3D uh, pre-comp it, and to pre-comp you control shift C, move all attributes to a new composition, and then click on constant rasterization in blur layer, which is that tiny little sun next to the, um, the shy guy. Add an adjustment layer, add a compound blur. In that compound blur, set the blur layer to the pre-comp that you just made. I renamed the blur layer. And as you can see, it creates these awesome little blur lines around where the fingerprint white values are. I crush it down and ruin the effect, as you can see now. Um, but that's how I get those um, almost real world screeny effects. Um, yeah. Nice and simple, uh, you just gotta know which buttons, and there are, again, there's probably better ways of doing this. I'm just stuck in my ways of adding certain effects in a certain way. Uh, but that's how I do those. And you can go as far as you want with that. You can add scratches in, and you can cut the scratches out of the, you know, the, the UI, so it makes it look like the screen has scratches or lost pixels. There's loads of things you can do. You could pixelate all of this and make it look as though, you know, it had, oh, there's me trying to add a blur again. Give up. Give up, mate. Yeah, you could make this look like it was, you know, a CRT screen. Again, this wasn't meant to be a tutorial about After Effects. Um, if you guys have questions about any of this, and I'm sure you will, because I've been rambling in this tutorial is quick, uh, let me know, and I will try and answer if I can, either on Instagram or wherever I post this. Um... Yeah, so at the moment that's it. I think what I do now is I pre-comp all that. Again, Control shift c add it all into a pre-comp and I'm gonna make a, uh, a chromatic aberration out of the box. Uh, I think it's Daniel Danielson. Has some great After Effects tutorials in Cinema 4D. I learned this trick from him. Add a shift channels and set the red channel to red and turn the other channels off. Duplicate that layer and do the same thing for the green and the blue channel. So you've got one composition that's completely green, one composition is completely red, one composition is completely blue. And if you screen these layers over the top of each other, they will add together and make your original image. Wow, there you go. So, and then what we wanna do, we wanna blur the outside. So yeah, I add a adjustment layer, I think, and I add a radial blur to, the, to that layer to blur the edges, there you go. You have to click on the type because we don't want it to spin. We want to zoom to make it look like the stuff's going out. It's a little, it's a little nicer, I think. And then we're going to add a mask to that effect so it's only applied around the edges of the screen. So it looks like, I don't know, there's some awesome kind of uh, camera blur going on. Um, oh, that's my shortcuts going weird. There you go. You'll add that. You'll have to invert the, the map and then add a feather. Just press F on the mask for a shortcut to the feather. There you go, and it's kind of like blurred it in a little bit more. Great. Now there's a little thing called optics compensation, and that's gonna, again, bend out around the edges. Um, so there you go, you can see, you put one to 20 on the bottom layer, or whatever you want, and then you just invert it on the top layer. And look at that around the edges, you've got a sweet little chromatic aberration. Um, and then what I tend to do, just two effects I add over the top of everything just to kind of make it sit in the composition better is pixel motion blur um, I find that quite a good motion blur standard settings I never mess about with them and then add grain if you want to really make your renders take forever in After Effects but they make them look a little better I turn these values way down because they come in crazy but it just adds a little texture you can add an overlay bit of footage um, yeah I mean that's pretty much it so you've hey, you've got it um, I know I've been rambling for ages, tutorial didn't need to be this long, um, 
but yeah two keyframes and we make something that's pretty cool if you take away even all the after effects stuff all the effects you've got you know out of the box something that looks pretty good and imagine if someone you weren't doing the design for this and I know say you're a freelancer and someone's done a load of designs in Illustrator and they're just they do a load of line art and it looks really complicated well if you say all right great I'll drop it into Calvary as one SVG put one keyframe on and animate 300 lines at once and I'll look like a speed demon of animation and uh, you, you'll get hired again uh, because you'll be super quick or you can take forever and tell them it took you a while and charge more money and have free time to do with what you want. Uh, it, the choice is yours. At the moment, you can see I'm trying and failing to add a, another layer in, in Z space. Don't know what I was thinking. We get rid of that because it was shy. Great. Back to where we were. And then I just click render. And yeah, we'll go over that in a second. There we are, look at that. I'm glad you've done this with me. Uh, I apologize if I've gone too quickly in places. I know I have. Um, I didn't plan this very well. Next one will be better. Any tips, please feel free to share them, but I hope you found it interesting. And uh, if you wanna know more, there'll be some links to uh, the actual cavalry tutorials done by the people that really know how to use them in uh, this video somewhere so uh, yeah shout out to the scene group guys and um, cavalry in general for making all this kind of work that you see and now possible um, anything's possible in cavalry really uh, with a little help uh, from you know the Adobe suite but you know as, as, as we go forward I don't think I'll be using either Illustrator or After Effects as much so but yeah just one more tool thanks guys